This is Joe DeFranco. I'd like to welcome everyone to the presentation. Today we'll be reviewing crane access and egress, work area control, and some safe practices to prevent injuries. Uh, at Construction Safety Experts, we provide various safety compliance and training services. You can see here certified crane operator training with practical and written testing. Uh, annual overhead mobile and tower crane inspections and load testing. And in that area, we'll talk about some of the requirements for steps, handholds, guardrails, uh, some of the things that relate to the access and, and the egress for crane operators and other equipment. We talk about rigor and signal person training services, uh, forklift, area lift operator training, accident investigations, so some of the things we've looked at in the past when we didn't have the safe work practices in place, job site evaluations, witness services, and, and OSHA citation reviews. So slips, trips, and falls, uh, those hazards are associated with mobile equipment mounting and dismounting, and cab access and egress, equipment operators, riggers, and other personnel are frequently mounting and dismounting from parts of the equipment and sometimes we have the injuries resulting. Uh, particularly falls while engaged in these activities do occur, and we could have ankle sprains, knee or back sprain, and even broken bones or sometimes fatalities. So want to look at the safe work practices to avoid these types of injuries. We want to ensure that cranes and other mobile equipment have safe, well-designed access systems and walking working surfaces in accordance with the standards, so the OSHA standards, and also manufacturer specifications. By following the requirements for fall protection and equipment access and egress, we're going to review in this presentation. This will aid us in preventing these injuries. You can see here uh, one that we looked at in the past. We talked about the, the access, the egress, the condition of the walking working surfaces for mobile cranes. Typically, if we have a mobile crane, we'll probably have a tractor trailer involved that may be used to transport the lifting devices, the extensions, uh, parts of the crane them, themselves, if they're larger machines, the counterweights. So we want to pay attention to the tractor trailers also, the conditions of the decks, are there holes or openings. Uh, this particular one individual got got his foot caught in that opening, uh, severe uh, strain to the knee, and uh, want to make sure we get that addressed. Looking at some definitions in the standard, 1926-1401 talks about a competent person. So when we look at the OSHA standards, typically a competent person can identify existing and predictable hazards and then has the authority to take action to eliminate those hazards. Definition of a qualified person has a recognized degree, certificate, professional standing, extensive knowledge, training, and skill, and can resolve problems relating to the subject matter. So when we look at the inspection requirements relating to our mobile cranes, what type of inspection categories do we have? We can see here modified equipment, uh, repaired or adjusted equipment, and post-assembly, that's by a qualified person. And if we do have modified equipment, uh, if it affects capacity or the safe operation of the crane, that does have to be approved in writing by the manufacturer. We have shift inspections. That's completed by a competent person. Monthly inspections by a qualified person. Those are documented records kept for a minimum of three months. And then annual inspections also by a qualified person and kept for a minimum of a 12-month period here. Uh, equipment access adequate in this photo, so want to pay attention not only to the steps, the handholds, the guardrails, the walking working surfaces on the crane, but how are we getting to our equipment? Are there designated walk areas that are maintained? Are we going to have a slip and uh, trip or fall on the way to getting to the crane in this situation? If we look at annual inspection criteria for the cranes, we can see the items listed here, the equipment structure, uh, shivs, drums, gas, diesel, electric, other power plants. And then on the following slide here, we can see hydraulic, pneumatic, 
other pressurized hoses, fittings, and tubing. Uh, so again, if we're having problems with that, if they're creating a leak or a spill, uh, that slip trip hazard could contribute to that. Also, originally equipped steps, ladders, handrails, are they uh, guards, are they missing, unusable, or in unsafe condition, we'd want to get that addressed. On this particular slide, we can see damage to the step, the bottom rung, uh, the, the third rung as well. So part of our monthly annual inspection, want to get that addressed, get that repaired, replaced. Some problems with, with the steps on mobile cranes we see from time to time. Uh, a lot of the, the machines have removable extension pieces, particularly on the bottom steps. Sometimes those are attached with rubber pieces. Uh, sometimes the whole stair system is removable itself, so it's common for those uh, extensions to get damaged or, or be missing altogether, so we want to look out for that, uh, particularly if we're using uh, the outriggers and extending those outriggers and we need that bottom uh, extension to get proper access to the crane. Annual inspection, the, uh, some criteria listed under 1926-1412 here. Again, originally equipped steps, ladders, handrails, guards, are they missing? Are they unusable in an unsafe condition? Uh, the inspection must include a functional test to determine that equipment is functioning properly. So a functional test of the steps, the handrails, putting some force um, on those items visually inspecting those, is there rust, are they loose, are any of the connections uh, not in good condition there. If we look at some additional requirements for the steps and handholds and ladders, the employer must maintain in good condition originally equipped steps, handholds, ladders, guardrails, and grab rails. Equipment manufactured after November 8, 2011, that's when the new standard was put into effect. Equipment must be equipped so as to provide safe access and egress between the ground and the operator's workstations, including the forward and rear positions, with aid of devices such as steps, handholds, ladders, guardrails, railings, and grab rails. And the criteria those are specified to, you can see listed, SAE and ISO requirements found in the standard. Walking stepping surfaces, uh, except for a crawler crane, must have slip-resistant features. So we look for diamond plate, metal, strategically placed grip tape, expanded metal, or slip-resistant paint on those walking surfaces to prevent that slip hazard. Here we can see uh, if we have a spill, not only a hazard uh, on the ground, but did it, did it spill on the deck of the machine? Uh, creating a hazard on the walkway there. If we look at design, construction, and testing, the standard talks about a clear passageway provided from the operator station to an exit door on the operator's side. This enables the operator to enter and exit the equipment safely and allows for escape in the event of an emergency there. Also, if we look at a cab roof, if that is to serve as a workstation, the requirement there, it's capable of supporting 250 pounds without permanent distortion. So if we have to do any work or, or walking on the cab roof, we see the requirement. When we look at that new OSHA crane standard, they, they have some statistics throughout. You can see falls have traditionally been the leading cause of deaths among construction workers, and also falls from cranes when the operator is entering or leaving the crane also can cause numerous non-fatal injuries to construction workers. So fall protection training, the employer must train each employee who may be exposed to fall hazards covered by the standards. So the fall protection standards we can see listed there and then any of the fall protection requirements throughout the crane standard, fall protection for assembly, disassembly work, fall protection, and using personnel platforms, all the requirements here. If we look at 1926-1423 boom walkways, 
and that's equipment manufactured after November 8, 2011. Lattice booms have to be equipped with walkways. If the vertical profile of the boom from cord centerline to cord centerline is six feet or more, and the walkway criteria it has to be at least 12 inches wide. Uh, in that standard, under that section, it talks about guardrails, railings, and other permanent fall protection along the walkways are not required, and they're prohibited on booms supported by pendant ropes or bars if the guardrails, railings, or attachments could get snagged by the ropes or the bars. So we can see the requirements for walkways and what it talks about for guardrails and railings on the lattice boom crane. Fall protection for non-assembly, disassembly work. Typically, fall protection, if we look at the general industry standards, we talk about four feet or higher. Uh, the construction OSHA standards, six feet or higher. We have some different requirements in the crane standard that, that deal with 15 feet. So in, under that 1926-1423, if we're talking about non-assembly, disassembly work, the employer must provide and ensure the use of fall protection if we're on a walking working surfaces with an unprotected side or edge more than six feet above a lower level. As follows, if we're moving point to point on non-lattice booms, whether they're horizontal or not horizontal, and then on lattice booms that are not horizontal, and on horizontal lattice booms where the fall distance is 15 feet or more. So we see the requirement of 15 feet. So one thing to keep in mind, the OSHA standards are the minimum requirements. Typically, if we go to a project, they're going to still say six feet for fall protection, and we need to comply with the most stringent requirement, whether it's the company policy or customers' rules or regulations or the, the standard itself. While at work on uh, at a workstation, on any part of the equipment, including the boom of any type, except if we're near the draw works when the equipment is running in the cab or on the deck, uh, fall protection there. So we don't want the exposure of, uh, if we're near draw works, of our harness or lanyard being caught in that machinery. For assembly disassembly work, the employer must provide and ensure the use of fall protection on a walking working surface with an unprotected side or edge more than 15 feet above a lower level. Again, except when near draw works, when equipment is running in the cab or on the deck. And that's 15 feet. Uh, if we have a boom that's laying down, it may be 15 feet in some areas. It may be uh, more than that if it's spanning a gap or, or an opening. So we want to keep that in mind as well. Uh, we've been talking about fall protection for uh, Ground personnel and crane operators also want to pay attention to fall protection for our customers or, or people working around or with our cranes. Uh, in this particular slide, we can see setting some materials uh, in the building here. Uh, the individual actually climbed out on the ledge and had no fall protection in place. So uh, something to look that everyone can look out for their fall hazards with you know other contractors or, or people working with our equipment. Uh, this particular photo, we can see there was a, a wire rope guardrail in place here preventing uh, the setting of that equipment in, in the building uh, without damaging the load line. You can see the load line there has some tension on it. So maybe a safe approach would be to remove the temporary guardrail and have the individuals use a personal fall arrest system tied off in the building. So pre-job planning and, and ways how we can eliminate these hazards, this exposure. Also want to talk about uh, fall protection anchoring to the load line. In the past, if, if we asked the question, can we tie off to a crane's hook or, or load line, typically the answer was no. Uh, the new standard does address that. It says a personal fall arrest system is permitted to be anchored to the crane's hook or other part of the load line where the following requirements are met. And that's a qualified person determines that the setup and rated capacity of the crane, including the hook, load line, and rigging, meets the requirements in the fall protection standard. So a qualified person would have to determine that. Also, the equipment operator must be at the work site and inform that the equipment is being used for this purpose. So is it set up properly? Are the brakes uh, set, locked in position? Is everything in good shape if we're going to have people 
tying off to the crane hook or load line. Also, no load is suspended from the load line when the personal fall arrest system is anchored to the crane's hook or other part of the load line. Uh, personnel platform needed here, we can see um, the, the standard does talk about arbor chairs or Bozeman's chairs. Um, also, a suspended personnel platform. We would have many requirements in place to do that properly. Trial lift proof testing, uh, the proper fall protection in the suspended personnel platform tying off to a structural member of the basket. So we'd want to have that in place. I also want to talk about work area control. So we've talked about some uh, access issues and some fall protection. We want to eliminate the slip, trip, and fall hazards. And we also want to prevent struck by hazards, uh, such as being struck by a load, a boom, uh, the, being struck by the crane superstructure or counterweight. And that has to deal uh, do with our work area control here. It says, to prevent employee, employees from entering hazardous areas, the employer shall instruct employees assigned to work on or near equipment as authorized personnel. They have to be able to recognize pinch crush hazards posed by the rotating superstructure, and then erect and maintain control lines, railings, or similar barriers to mark the boundaries of the hazard. So hazard recognition, and everyone's properly trained as authorized personnel. If we look at safety devices, uh, when we look at the standard, they talk about operational aids and safety devices. Uh, some examples of safety devices are crane level indicator, the boom stops, the jib stops. And what we're talking about here for work area control, the horn is either built into the equipment or on the equipment immediately available to the operator. So the operator is watching uh, the load, what's going on in front of him. He can sound the horn if there's an issue, stop the function, so that horn does have to be there. Uh, it goes on to say temporary alternative measures are not permitted for safety devices. If we have operational aids and that device is not working properly, we might be able to implement a temporary alternative measure with safety devices. If that, if that item is not working, we basically have to shut the machine down until it's repaired or replaced. So can't have a temporary alternative measure for a safety device. So for example, if the horn's not working, we need to get that replaced, repaired. Keeping clear of the lows, uh, also talking about our work area control. So where available, hoisting routes that minimize the exposure of employees to hoisted loads must be used. And no employee must be within the fall zone except for employees that are hooking, unhooking, or guiding a load or engaged in the initial attachment of the load to the component or structure or operate a concrete hopper or bucket. If employees are engaged in hooking or unhooking or guiding the load or the initial connection of a load to a component or structure and are within the fall zone, so anywhere that an item can fall from the crane's hook below, all the following criteria must be met. It says the materials being hoisted must be rigged to prevent unintentional displacement. Hooks with self-clothing latches or their equivalent must be used. And the standard is specific. It has an exception there. It says J-hooks are permitted to be used for setting wooded trusses if we're building that new home, for example. And the materials must be rigged by a qualified rigger. Receiving a load, only employees needed to receive a load are permitted within the fall zone when the load is being landed. So. Uh, Authorized personnel, rigor, signal person, possibly a supervisor, but we don't. We want uh, the non-essential personnel not in that work area. Also, looking here, if we're talking about safety latches, um, a hook safety latch can be removed or disabled if a qualified person determines that it's safer to hoist and place the load without the latch or with the latch removed. So we can tie back that latch if it is a, a, a safer approach, if it eliminates a fall hazard, for example. Uh, if that is the case, uh, routes, the hoisting routes have to be pre-planned so no employees are in the fall zone. Unless hooking or unhooking a load, then they, they would be in the fall zone there for that purpose. So the purpose of the safety latch is to 
keep the rigging on the crane hook when the hook is in a slack condition. If we're making a lift, there's tension there, the rigging's not going anywhere. When we go to set the load down, that's when the rigging wants to come off the crane hook, and that's uh, part of the purpose of the safety latch. So the standard says that if it's a safer, more practical method to remove it or disable it or tie it back, if it eliminates uh, an exposure, uh, there are exceptions for that we can see here. If we look at some of our uh, qualification requirements in the standard rigor qualification, qualified rigor is required for assembly, disassembly work. When employees are engaged in hooking, unhooking, or guiding the load, or the initial connection of a load to component or structure, and are within the fall zone, the materials are rigged by qualified rigor. And then the standard 1926-251 also talks about rigging inspections each day before being used, the swing and all fastening and attachments inspected for damage or defects by a competent person designated by the employer. And then also 1926-753 hoisting and rigging requirements for qualified riggers and steel erection there. Also want to pay attention to our warning decals on our crane. Uh, they have to be legible. We don't want those to be greased down or faded or, or torn up where we can't read those. If we talk about work area control or, or people trained uh, to the particular hazards, one thing we do always stress is power line safety. The new standard talks about one power line warning decal in the cab visible to the operator while at the controls and then two on the outside of the crane. Also want to make sure that your power line warning decals are updated with the new standard is the breast approach. Uh, the new standard talks about 20 feet of clearance for a power line that's up to 350,000 volts or 50 feet of clearance for a line that exceeds 350 kV. So maintain the clearance or we have three choices we can choose from. The line is de-energized and visibly grounded by the utility owner. That's the safest, most uh, safest method. but not always the most practical, takes the most time and planning, but is the safest approach there to de-energize and physically ground the line. We can also have clearance, maintain the clearance from the prohibited zone with additional encroachment prevention methods uh, specified in the standard. Or if we have to work closer than 20 feet, we can refer to table A that you see on the decal there. And that is the minimum approach distance under table A with additional encroachment prevention measures. So I want to make sure, again, everyone's trained to the power line hazards that's working around the cranes. If you look at your power line warning decals, and they, they're the older type that say uh, stay 10 feet away from power lines, that's really no longer accurate. So we do want to keep that in mind. Under tra the training section of the standard, 1926-1430, it says the employer must provide training as follows. So again, overhead power line safety topics. Anyone working around that mobile crane needs to be able to recognize those hazards. Uh, training for operators, operators in training, uh, competent persons, so who are supervisors, um, who are people doing inspections, the items we looked at there qualified persons, riggers, and signal persons. Also have to have training for crunch, uh, crush pinch uh, point hazards. The employer must train each person, person who works with the equipment to keep clear of holes, crush pinch points, and the hazards addressed in 1926-1424, which is the work area control we talked about. And then training for tag out and startup procedures for our our maintenance personnel, anyone involved with crane work. We want to verify credentials and training prior to crane rigging and signaling work. So uh, if we're planning the project, who is the crane operator? Are they certified for the, the category of the equipment they're going to be operating? Who is the qualified rigger? This, who is the qualified signal person? We should have a training certification record, whether uh, paperwork or a pocket card like you see here. Who are the individuals doing our crane inspections? Are they certified or or what are their credentials for crane inspections, the shift, the monthly, the annual inspections we talked about? 
And OSHA does look for these training certification records. This is one that I looked at recently that involved a fall protection citation. You can see there, 29 CFR 1926-503, the fall protection standard. Employees were on a roof 32 feet off the ground, had not received fall protection training, and we need a written certification of fall protection training record that comes right out of the standard. So what is the topic, fall protection, and then the identity of the employee trained, the dates of the training, and the signature of the person who conducted the training. Uh, you can see $500 citation there, but again, the more important issue, exposed to a 32-foot fall uh, fatality on our hands if, if that happens to the employee there. So the employer's responsibility to provide a safe place of employment for the employees they go home at the end of the day the same way they came to work, okay, and then also trying to avoid the citations, want to stay in compliance with the standards, and that is the goal to have a safe work site. So some safe work practices for, uh, for preventing these injuries that we're talking about here today, we can see here maintain three-point contact at all times if we're talking about uh, working on a ladder or the steps and the handrails, two hands and one foot or one hand and two feet. This allows for greater stability and control and reduces the possibility of a fall. So here we can see it is three points of contact. Uh, one of the points of contact on the, uh, the individual's shoulder there. And you can see here overextending, all right, not having the right tools and equipment for the job. Maybe a scaffold would be more appropriate, uh, appropriate here. Those are the things we want to consider. Preventing uh, injuries continued here. So some other safe work practices uh, face towards the equipment, both when mounting and dismounting. This allows for better balance, use of handholds, handrails, and better contact of the foot with the steps. So we don't want to walk forward down a step ladder, for example. Uh, want to face the ladder face the handhold to the steps when mounting and dismounting. Do not jump from the equipment. It increases the impact forces on the knees, ankles, and spine. It can cause sprain or over time uh, chronic conditions. Slipping and falling when landing can cause uh, even fatal results. I've seen some serious injuries where individuals even jump from the second to last step of a extension ladder and, and twisted their ankle pretty severely. And, resulting in some lost time injuries. So those are the things we want to review with everybody. Some other safe work practices, mount and dismount equipment only where steps, ladders, and hand handrails, handholds are provided. So we don't want to jump from the deck of the crane or from our tractor trailer. Again, want to use the steps, the handholds, eliminate that exposure. Wear footwear with slip resistant soles and clean the mud off the footwear. So you may have to do that several times a day, but uh, have a way to, again, designate the walk areas to and from the equipment that are, that are maintained and, and a way to clean the steps, the, the handhold, the ladders, uh, clean the footwear as well. Look before mounting and dismounting to be sure there are no obstacles. Are there holes, uneven ground, any ice, mud, or other conditions we need to be aware of? Do not carry anything in our hands. You use a hand line. Okay, in a bag or a bucket to raise or lower equipment, that is the safe approach rather than trying to carry something up a ladder or the steps there while we're getting on the equipment. Be sure to repair damaged equipment such as steps, ladders, handrails, and hand holds. We said keep equipment free of oil, grease, mud, ice, and snow, so wipe it down. Uh, just like our housekeeping and continual effort have to probably do that several times throughout the shift, if it's a rainy day or, or muddy, whatever the case may be. Ensure that walking, working surfaces have uh, anti-slip materials, not damaged and free of any trip hazards. There's no extension cords or welding leads or other things that we might trip on in the walkways. Consider the use of aerial lifts, guardrails, scaff scaffolds, ladders, uh, maybe stanchions with horizontal lifelines or other fall protection systems at the shops or on the job sites. So if we're doing involved with assembly or disassembly work or maybe maintenance, 
or uh, putting on the extensions on the crane, for example. Is there something we can tie off to? Um, at the shop, we might have those systems built where we have a stanchion with a, a horizontal lifeline runs. So we can tie off to that when doing our maintenance work or, or repair work or anything like this. Review company uh, injury data to determine if employees are experiencing injuries related to equipment access systems. Ask for employee input. What are some things they've seen in the field? And take steps to prevent accidents within your company. So we basically reviewed uh, some hazards and safe work practices associated with equipment access and egress, fall protection systems, and some of our work zone requirements. Um, if you'd like more information, please feel free to give me a contact. You can see my number there, 919-417-2139. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for your time.